The lecture I'm going to give this morning is an incredibly important lecture because I believe the future of the human race is dependent on the right running of the hormones. How many couples can't have children? It's quite phenomenal, isn't it? What's the next question? Why? What's happened? What are some of the symptoms of a woman having a hormonal imbalance? Some of the symptoms would be a young girl getting her periods at the age of nine. Do you know what normal is? 16. How many girls do you find today getting their periods at 16? If you find a 100-year-old lady, ask her when she got her periods. She'll say 16. And she, you ask her when her girlfriend's got it, it will all be about the same age. We've actually forgotten what is normal. And if a young girl's getting her periods at nine, what's she thinking about at 13? Something she shouldn't be thinking about till she's marrying age. It's a little scary, isn't it? Childhood doesn't last that long, so we've got to um, make the most of it. Prolong it as long as possible. So a young girl getting her periods at nine is a symptom of a hormonal imbalance. Very heavy periods, very painful periods, premenstrual tension, all symptoms of a hormonal imbalance. And then going a little bit further to endometriosis, to heart disease, to, to clots, to depression, breast cancer, uterine cancer, fibroids in the uterus, cysts in the ovaries. These are just some of the symptoms that a woman will experience with a hormonal imbalance. What about a men? Men also can have a hormonal imbalance. What are some of the symptoms? One symptom will be, uh, it's called PD, penile dysfunction, inability to hold an erection. The current figures now are 50% of men over the age of 40 cannot hold an erection. Ah, what's happening? Low sperm count. Homosexuality, too much of the female hormone. Prostate. We didn't know what the word prostate meant 20 years ago. It's almost a household name today, isn't it? Prostate. These are some of the symptoms that a man will have of a hormonal imbalance. What I'm going to show you this morning is how the monthly cycle should run. Then I'm going to show you what throws that cycle out. And then I'm going to show you how you can get the balance back. Notice that our sex hormones are made from cholesterol. Very important lipid. If someone's on cholesterol-lowering medication, they can be having a hormonal imbalance because they haven't got the cholesterol to make the hormones. Did you know also that our vitamin D is made from cholesterol? So these are two problems people can have on cholesterol-lowering medication. From cholesterol, the body makes pregnenolone. From pregnenolone, the body makes progesterone, and it's from progesterone that estrogen's made, from progesterone that testosterone is made, and from progesterone that our adrenal hormones are made. Our adrenal hormones are like our stress hormones, our fight and flight hormones. You can see that progesterone's a very important hormone. What I've got down here is the monthly cycle, and I'm going to explain the monthly cycle like a dance, because it is like a dance. Different players come onto the stage at different times of the month. In this dance, progesterone will be one of the star players and progesterone will be wearing a green dress and progesterone's nickname is Happy Hormone. I don't know of anyone who doesn't want heaps of that. Do you remember what they said of Patch Adams? One of his problems was he had excessive happiness. Estrogen. Estrogen is going to be wearing a red dress and estrogen's role in the human body is that of a cell proliferator. Cell proliferator basically means causes massive cell growth. It is estrogen that levels are high when a young girl is beginning to develop into a woman. So estrogen's very important, but estrogen is like fire and water, good slave, bad master. Don't we love fires in the, hot, in, the, in the cold weather? But we saw what fires did in Marysville. And don't we love water? We can't live without water. But on the news at the moment, well, they're evacuating thousands from, uh, from Queensland because of the floods. And estrogen is like that. It's like carbohydrates. Carbohydrates aren't bad, but out of control they are. Estrogen's not bad. But when the estrogen levels go too high, that's when problems arise. Let's have a look at this dance. Let's have a look at the monthly cycle. 
Day one is the day that a woman begins to menstruate. Day one of the cycle, progesterone levels are low. So progesterone is backstage, so to speak. Day one of the cycle, estrogen levels are low. But by day seven, estrogen levels are rising up until day 11, where estrogen is now the star player in the dance. Let's go to the stage where the dance is being played out, which is the reproductive organs of a woman's body. This is the uterus, these are the fallopian tubes, they're the ovaries, that's the cervix, and this is the birth canal or the vagina. Let's have a look at what estrogen is doing this time of the month. Estrogen, with being a cell proliferator, is causing massive cell growth in the lining of the uterus, causing the blood nest to develop. for the possibility of a little egg and sperm might meet and it will nourish. Estrogen is also causing massive cell growth in the ovaries to cause an egg to develop. Estrogen is also causing massive cell growth in the glands that feed the birth canal, releasing a lubricant. By day 14, a fully developed egg bursts forth from the ovaries. The little fingers on the end of the fallopian tube pull the egg up into the tubes and the tubes are ever moving, ever pushing, ever pushing that egg upwards, upwards. There is no need for oestrogen anymore and oestrogen's been given the message, you can go backstage now, your dance has finished. The little hole where the egg bursts forth, develops a blister. And that blister is called the corpus luteum. I'm drawing it in green because it is the main site of progesterone production in a woman's body. Can you see how important it is for a woman to ovulate? Because when she ovulates, her corpus luteum is developed. And when it's developed, it is the main site of progesterone, happy hormone production in a woman's body. What other effect does progesterone have? Because by day 14, with the production of corpus luteum, or the development of corpus luteum, progesterone levels rise. So progesterone is now the main player in the dance. Progesterone has a ripening effect on the lining of the uterus. I liken progesterone to the plasterers and the painters putting the finishing touches on the blood nest. Progesterone also increases a woman's mood, being the happy hormone, to the point of increasing her sexual desire at this time of the month. But progesterone also has an effect on the cervix. Let's magnify the cervix and I'll show you what's happening. The cervix usually looks like this with its two lips and a mucus plug. Under the effect of progesterone at this time of the month, the mucus plug goes, the lips come up a little bit tighter, but not only that, a special form of lubricant is released around the cervix. This lubricant is specifically designed to facilitate the entry of sperm up and into the uterus. So you can see the stage is set for the entry of man. Let's say man enters, what happens? Did you know that between 200 and 500 million sperm are released with one ejaculation? And some of the time half comes out, which means you're left with about half of that amount. If the sperm meet this cervix, they have a fair bit of trouble getting in. If the sperm meet this cervix, as soon as they hit that special lubricant, it almost grabs them and shoots them up into the uterus. And they've got a long journey. And some of them go down the wrong road. And some of them go down the right road. The ones that go down the wrong area, they basically die and get absorbed and taken away through the bloodstream. The ones that go down the right road connect with the egg. I saw a photograph one day of 15 sperm all trying to gain entry into an egg but only one does. A girl said to me one day, oh no, with me too did. My sister and I shared the placenta. But the majority of time, one, one sperm gains entry into the egg. As soon as that sperm gains entry into the egg and the cells divide, 
With the, that division to produce the first two cells, did you know that the DNA is perfectly intact for the production of a new human being? Isn't that amazing? All the information in those first two cells of a new human being. Quite amazing. But the fallopian tube is ever pushing, ever pushing, so that little union travels down and eventually settles into the lining of the uterus. I was reading a book recently about this and it was saying how at a certain stage those epithelial cells, they weaken a little bit so that that union can get in and they shoot out two things like oki straps, connect and pull themselves in. It's just fascinating what science can tell us about this. Isn't it a miracle that you and I are here when you have a look that everything that must be in place for a new human being. What happens if those cells connect and begin to divide to make a new human being or pregnancy begins? Progesterone levels soar 200%. I've had ladies say to me, it was the best time of my life. I said, yes, your progesterone levels were very high. I was pregnant or breastfeeding non-stop for 14 years. I breastfed three months into every pregnancy. Some people go, oh, you poor thing. I say, no, 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 it was wonderful. <laughs> I did love it. Progesterone levels must have been nice and high. That helps. By the way, what would be the reason for postnatal depression? It would be a lack of progesterone. It actually can be that simple. And we'll look at that a little bit more in a, in a minute. But let's say the connection did not happen. By day 26, progesterone levels are dropping. By day 26, estrogen levels too are dropping right down. So progesterone and estrogen now are going backstage. When both of those levels drop, the blood supply to the uterus cuts. And when the blood supply cuts, the blood nest comes away. And once again, we are at day one of the monthly cycle. Let me tell you something about sperm before we go on. How does sperm survive? Because it is an alien to woman's body. Well, when sperm goes through the prostate gland of a man, it takes on an immune suppressant property. So that when sperm goes into woman, woman's immune system rises to attack, the immune suppressant property of sperm knocks her immune system back and survives. But did you know that woman's body has memory? And every time her husband enters her, the immune system rises and goes, oh, it's okay, it's husband. We'll just stand back. <laughs> but can you see how dangerous it can be when a woman has multiple partners? It can really knock back her immune system. What about a pap smear? A pap smear is a little graze or a nip taken out of the cervix to test for abnormal cells. Let's say a woman has a pap smear. That night she's intimate with her husband. The team that has come to the aid and to heal that little scrape, when sperm enters, they basically have to stand back because they cannot function in the presence of sperm because the immune suppressant property. And let's say it happens in the evening in bed and the woman does not rise till the morning because the sperm lays there all night, the team can't get back on healing the cervix. Now let's say she's a very, not till the morning, Let's say she's a very sexually active woman. It's happening two nights out of three. Six months later, she has a pap smear and they just happen to take it on the same area, abnormal cells. What caused the abnormal cells? Ah, the first pap smear that was never able to heal. A woman should be told that for four weeks after a pap smear not to allow sperm to enter her. Would it take four weeks to heal? Not in a healthy woman. But there are some women who don't walk, who don't eat natural food, who don't drink their water, who are having too much coffee, too much wine, too many cigarettes, it would take four weeks in that woman. So four weeks is said basically to cover women whose bodies aren't functioning effectively. One lady said, my husband couldn't wait four weeks. I said, well, he has to wear a condom or use withdrawal method. The, the uh, sperm must never enter it to allow that wound to heal. That's how the monthly cycle should run. But in many people, it is not running like that. Why? 
Newton's third law of motion states that to every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. What has happened? That this cycle is being disrupted. Number one, let's make a list of what is causing a disruption of this cycle. The proverb goes even so far as to say the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, no problem happens without a cause. Well, it happened in 1957. It began in 1957. Women wanted to be able to have sex without falling pregnant and so the contraceptive pill was introduced to women. Men and women have are and will continue to pay a very high price for this so-called sexual freedom. What is the pill? The pharmaceutical companies grow acres and acres of Mexican wild yam. From Mexican wild yam they can extract a phytochemical called diostenin and in a laboratory diostenin can be converted to progesterone. It's called progesterone because it has an identical molecular structure to the progesterone that is made in a woman's body. But they can't patent that. You can only patent something new. That's why the pharmaceutical companies can't patent sodium bicarb. Yeah? <laughs> it's just a naturally occurring substance. So they add a few more atoms to one area and come up with a synthetic estrogen. A few more atoms are added to another area and synthetic progesterone is created. These synthetic hormones are what is in the pill and when those synthetic hormones are fed into the biochemical pathway that your body uses to make its own hormones, it causes a slight disruption and that's what they want. And the body thinks, what's this disruption? Must be pregnant. So the body stops releasing the egg and the woman doesn't fall pregnant. And if the woman stops releasing an egg, what's not made? Corpus luteum is not made. Month after month on the pill, what's happening now is, you see progesterone's your number one hormone, estrogen number two. Month after month on the pill, what's happening to progesterone? No ovulation, no corpus luteum made, no progesterone. Month after month on the pill with its synthetic estrogen, what's happening to estrogen? Good slave, bad master is now the master. And it is this situation called progesterone deficiency, estrogen dominance, that is causing all the problems that we are seeing. What does the cycle look like now? Estrogen's far too high, progesterone is far too low. And what does the woman feel like one week before her monthly cycle? Watch out, she'll bite your head off. It's called premenstrual tension. The part of time of the month where the progesterone should be high is not there. I said to one lady, do you have premenstrual tension? She said, no, I just hate my husband for a week every month. She's got it. <laughs> how many women think it's normal and how many men think it's normal? I've got some good news today. It's not normal. I'm going to show you how that can be turned around. A lady rang me up. She said, thank you for giving me my daughter back. Her daughter grew horns at the age of 13. How often do you see that? It should not be. And how many women? See, I'm a baby boomer. I was in my 20s in the 70s. Every girl I knew was on the pill. No one questioned it. Now the baby boomer women, our daughters are in their 30s their late 20s and it is that generation that you are seeing these huge problems. You see if a woman's on the pill before she gives birth to her baby that man or woman child will be born with hormonal imbalance. My son James is 34. He's got two mates who were widows. Widows with little children? Their, their wives died of breast cancer. We see it in the news. We see it on celebrities. <laughs> And then the woman goes through menopause. So the baby boomers are going through menopause now. And what's happening? They're having terrible trouble. I say to a woman, it's because you were on the pill. She said, no, no, that was 30 years ago. I said, that's right. The cycle was thrown out then. The levels were thrown out then. And unless something happens to tip them back, that's where they stay. And so the doctor puts the woman 
on hormone replacement therapy. And the hot flushes go away. What are the hot flushes? Too much estrogen. Estrogen causes capillary dilation and all the blood rushes to the skin and the woman's hot. The husband knows because that's when all the blankets get thrown off and then five minutes later they're back on again. Some women with high estrogen get migraines at period time. That's capillary dilation in the head. Some women don't get the flushes, they'll get the migraines. But I tell you what's almost across board in women in their 50s today is depression. What is it? It's a lack of the happy hormone. I've seen many women get off their antidepressants, re-establish their life by balancing out their hormones, getting the progesterone levels back where they should be. And we'll look at that in a minute. So what happens with HRT? Because HRT is more of these synthetic hormones. Why does it stop the flushes? Think, it tricks the body into thinking it's pregnant, so it puts its energies back into the uterine breast area. One lady said to me, six, ma six years on HRT, a lump developed in her breast. She had breast cancer. The doctor put her, took her off HRT immediately. Why did he do that? He knows. He knows it causes breast cancer. So you say, why do you do it? And he will say, she was suffering and it brought her relief. Because not every woman will get breast cancer, but a high amount do. One lady said to me, I'm on HRT, I love it, it makes my life bearable, I'm willing to take the risk. But what most people don't realise is there's a third option. Most people think you suffer or you take the drug with its side effect, but there is another option. And because the pharmaceutical company cannot patent progesterone, then most doctors are unaware of it. Number two, because there are some women that have never been on the pill and whose parents have never been on the pill. There's more. What causes a chicken to fully develop at five weeks of age? It is the growth stimulants. But they will say, well, there's no growth stimulants today. No, they've genetically modified the chooks so they just grow huge. They're still getting that growth stimulant. What about fish? Well, when you've got 80% of the women in Australia just about are on hormone replacement therapy or the pill, some sort of hormone treatment, they go to the toilet, the sewage goes out to sea, the breakdown from those metabolites create estrogen, an estrogen metabolite. The fish eat it. We've got, we've got female fish with male tendencies. We've got male fish with female tendencies. And then who eats the fish? The human and so they're getting it back again well what about lamb what about cattle well by law Australian cattle farmers are not allowed to give their their cattle growth stimulants but we had a cattle farmers wife here a year ago she said once a fortnight the pharmaceutical companies knock on their door they knock on her door and they know that they don't use it, but they're still knocking on the door. How much are they knocking on the door of the ones that do it? Because she said, we know they do it. But they stop it five months before market and it's not picked up in the blood test. And she told me that Australia is exporting meat, they're te testing the tissues overseas, finding the growth stimulants, and they're sending the meat back. I don't want to think about where that meat goes. So if it's in the meat, it's in the product. Lentils are sounding more attractive all the time, aren't they? We're going to show you how to make them taste fantastic. Number three, plastics. It's a plastic age, isn't it? Plastics are big today. I'm reading a fascinating book at the moment. A Canadian girl gave it to me. It's called Slow Death by Rubber Duck. And a fascinating story about how this group of women in Toronto, America, they campaigned to have the nasty plastics taken out of babies' bottles. O only there. That's a little scary, isn't it? You see, what gives the softness to plastic bottles is nonylphenols. And that is why the dashboard of new cars that doesn't crack anymore. Remember when the dash used to crack? It doesn't now. It's got non-alphenols in it. And most plastic bottles have that softness. 
There's another phenyl that's called bisphenol A. It's called BPA. And that's the one that you'll find lining the tins, lining plastic tins. Estrogen has a phenyl ring. Nonyl phenyls and bisphenyl A all have the phenyl ring. And that phenyl is the key that unlocks the door into the estrogen receptor site on the cell. So when plastics are con not so much consumed, but the food that touches them or is exposed to them, the person is taking those estrogen mimickers in. Let me just show you here the effect of the different estrogens. So here is an estrogen receptor site. So we only need three. These, these, this is a cell, three cells with three estrogen receptor sites. And I want to show you the difference between the different estrogens. This is a xenoestrogen. So your xenoestrogens come from your plastics, come from your herbicides, insecticides. You know what side means? It means to kill. So when a person's eating a lot of food that is grown with herbicides, insecticides, they're getting this, and also your chemicals. And many Australians are killing themselves with what they're cleaning their bathrooms, what they're washing their clothes in. Tomorrow night you'll see a DVD called Is Your House Killing You? It's a real eye-opener in, in all of these areas. Called xenoestrogens. They are 20,000 times stronger than human estrogen. So they're about that big. Here's human estrogen. And human estrogen, it just sits like this in the receptor site. And it's 20,000 times stronger than plant estrogen or phytoestrogen. Phyto means plant. Where do you get your plant estrogens? In your greens, your red clovers, your soy. So how big is it? It's only a little slip of a thing that just sits into the receptor site like that. Now when xenoestrogen comes in, which is actually 400,000 times stronger than the plant, it doesn't knock, it's got the key. It's got the key in these fennels and it just comes in whether you need it or not. Whereas plant estrogen found in the soy, it's synergistic. Synergistic means it works with the body. It comes to the cell and it knocks. Excuse me, can I come in? Cell says, please don't, we've got enough. Phytoestrogen says, well, I'll just sit at the door. And as a result, it protects against these guys. But if it knocks on the door and says, can I come in? And the cell says, we're a little low, please come in. That's the beauty of plants. They work with your body. Drugs do not do that. Drugs say, I'm coming in whether you need me or not. Drugs never cure disease. They interfere with the body functions. Let me show you the soybean grown in America today. Here it is, it's called Ready Roundup. Why is it called Ready Roundup? It's been genetically modified to resist Roundup. That's a bit scary. And so if a human being eats that soybean, it can cause disease by interfering with your DNA. A farmer in America told me one year, he said, they spray five times. Five times before harvest, they spray the soybean field. He said, all the weeds die and the soybean keeps growing. That's scary, isn't it? That soybean has not only been genetically modified, but it's got five doses of the xenoestrogens in it, the chemicals, the asides. If a human being eats that soybean, they're in trouble. As far as the east is from the west, is that soybean to a non-GMO organically grown soybean. It's a pity to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Asians have been enjoying the wonders of soy for centuries. Soybean contains more potent anti-cancer properties than any food on the planet. If you buy organic, you can be guaranteed it's not genetically modified. If an organic farmer uses genetically modified seed, he uses his status. And Dell knows that. Dell's an organic farmer. You can even buy them in the supermarket. You read in the paper, if you've got breast cancer, prostate cancer, don't eat soy. Don't eat soy? Which soy? Don't eat that soy, but eat that soy. That will help you heal. 
you ever read in the newspaper if you've got breast cancer or prostate cancer don't use plastics don't use insecticides herbicides don't use chemicals you will never read that you have to be careful what you read in the newspaper A friend of mine did a thesis on soy. When people ask her the soy question now, she says it's as simple as this. I say to them, God made soybean good, man mucked it up, end of question. So you can see when people are having the hormonal imbalance, it could be one of these, it could be two, it could be three. In every case, I find there are different threads that are coming together to create the situation. Get the chemicals out of the home. They're dangerous. Have a chemical-free home. You'll be the winner. If the human body was designed to heal itself, then all we have to do is give it the right conditions and the balance will come back. And that is absolutely true with the hormones. So that's why I've entitled this to return the balance. It's actually quite easy. Number one... You've got to turn the tap off. Eliminate everything that could be causing this. Eliminate the pill. Well, how are we going to stop having babies cropping up everywhere? Well, there are natural methods of birth control. My daughter Jessica mastered the natural methods of birth control so that her and her husband Matt had a great four years together before the little darling ones appeared. Because if there is a relationship's not established, those little ones can almost make or break a marriage. So what are the ways? Well, sex is two parts, so contraception should be two part. With a woman, there are three signs that she is ovulating. One is that her temperature changes. So what this requires is that a woman take her temperature before she get out of bed every single morning and she write it down. And she will find as the month goes, the temperature will go up and down just a little, then it'll drop and then go up onto a higher plane. Now that drop and up onto a higher plane, when a woman does it every day over a few months, she'll start to see the pattern. Dropping and going up onto a higher plane is an indication that ovulation has begun. That's one sign. The second sign is testing the vaginal mucus. Most of the time the vaginal mucus is thick, white, but at this time of the month, progesterone high, it becomes a lot more profuse and it's very um, clear and, and sticky. So she will also note that. And the other sign is that the cervix changes and that can be simple as checking that every day and, and noting that, the changes that are happening in the cervix. These three signs coming together are basically a foolproof way of knowing when a woman's ovulating. We've heard of the rhythm method, the Billings method, but this is the only one I know that actually takes the whole three signs that all come together. Most women will ovulate from about day 14 to maybe about day 23 to 24. So you can guess, but sometimes accidents happen with guesswork. I know my, my, my last child was born because I suddenly went to a 30, 33 day cycle and, the, and I was guessing and William's here. <laughs> So it takes the guesswork out of it a little bit. So for a man, he, he masters the art of withdrawal or uses condoms just at that time. And that is how Jess and Matt had a great four years before babies came. I guess three and a half, there was nine months of, of pregnancy there. So that's how you can eliminate the pill. My daughter Jessica says it like this. She says women should be taught that they're born with a treasure. This is my romantic daughter's way of explaining it. They're born with a treasure and they're sacred, they're to sacredly guard that treasure. They're not to let robbers take the treasure or they'll just stomp it into the ground and won't value it at all. And she is to present her treasure to her king, the man that has just promised to lay down his life for her in the wedding ceremony on the wedding night. <laughs> and he will treasure her treasure. Beautiful illustration of maybe keeping that till the wedding night. I say sex is the cherry on the cake. It's fantastic, but leave it as the cherry on the cake because the best time is with someone that you love very much. So it's also education. It's also educating young people in that way. 
HRT. I had a lady come and do our program who'd been 25 years on HRT. After six months of adhering to this balancing program, she was off HRT and she was balanced and doing very nicely. Eliminate the meat. If a person wants to eat meat and its product, it must be organic. It really, I do not believe at this stage in 2012 on planet Earth that there's an option. It's just too dangerous today because of what is happening to the meat, what's being given to the meat, what they're being fed, how they're killed, da 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 da, da the whole lot. Not only that, how it's stored. There was a 60 minute show a couple of years ago showing green meat and showing you pour this chemical on, it fizzes up and it goes red and then, a little bit scary, isn't it? Lentils are sounding more attractive all the time. Eliminate the plastic. I think it's impossible to eliminate plastic, such handy stuff. <laughs> but just become, just become aware of your safer plastic, your plastics that doesn't have the nonylphenols in them, the harder plastic, uh, usually doesn't have the nonyl phenols in it. You've got to read your labels, go to glass, even go to the second hand shop. They've always got a huge box of big glass jars right up the back. You can also get uh, Pyrex containers with Tupperware lids. The problem is when the plastic's heated. So if you've got a hot leftover stew in your little Pyrex, put a little china plate on top till it cools and then maybe put your plastic lid on top. You can pay 10 cents in Target and get a starch plastic bag. When I was in Samoa a few years ago, all their plastic bags are biodegradable. I thought, well, if Samoa can do it, <laughs> why can't we? But that was eight years ago and there's a lot more biodegradable plastic happening today. So just be very mindful of that. I think one of the scariest things is when children are being fed altered cow's milk, which is what all your S26, etc., etc., are, in plastic bottles heated up in microwaves. That's a little scary. Those babies will all be having endocrine problems by about the age of 9 and 10. That's why education is powerful. And it was exciting reading in Toronto all these ladies with their little prams and slings making this protest against the, the fennels in the baby's plastic bottles. And it was basically, and they're not there now. It's just often getting someone who will actually pull all that together, isn't it? And they always make a decision quickly when the babies are crying and running under the table and <laughs> let's get this over and done with. Aside, side means kill, go organic. The more people in Australia that demand organic, the more organic there will be. Where's your dollar going? Be very careful whose pocket your dollar goes in. I'm fussy on where my dollar goes. I'm not interested in supporting the multinationals. Go for, go for your organics because, as I said, the more people that demand them, the more they will be. And get a fork and log into the Lost Seed on the internet. It's a fantastic um, non-hybrid, non-GMO group of seeds from a friend of mine in Tasmania named Karen Martin and I have never had such a strike rate with these seeds, 99.9% .9 strike rate with the lost seed and with every packet you get she'll give you the whole history of where this lettuce came from or where this, and it's beautiful food. Chemicals, get the chemicals out of your home. Do you know you can save so much money, all you need to do at the supermarket is buy a two litre bottle of white vinegar and a packet of sodium bicarb, they're about $2.50. Oh, and a little thing of gumption, that's about all you need. We had, an, we had a green cleaner do our program. She said, I, I use three products, sodium bicarb, vinegar and Enyo cloths. You know the microfiber cloths? She, that's all she uses. Well, what do you use for uh, antibacteria? We don't need antibacteria unless we've got bacteria. <laughs> and it's only there if the house is not clean. Most people are killing themselves with these antibacterial. How many bugs are in the hospitals today are immune to all the antibacterials? They're actually just not doing it. Do you know Florence Nightingale had no antibacterial? She just cleaned it up. Number two, your liver 
has the ability to detoxify you from excess estrogen. So part of getting the balance back is getting rid of the excess estrogen. Your liver takes estrogen down one of two pathways. One pathway is the hydroxy-2 pathway. The other pathway is the hydroxy-16 pathway. Now, if the estrogen goes down the hydroxy-2 pathway, it is taken out of the body. If it goes down the hydroxy-16 pathway, it comes back into the body a hundred times more toxic. Let's call it Highway 2 and Highway 16. We don't want Highway 16. When I memorize things, I use little keys. 16 is complicated. We don't want the complicated one. You want the highway too. So what I'm going to do now is give you a list of herbs and foods and vitamins that will encourage highway 2 and discourage highway 16. Cabbage. The cabbage family contain indoles. And indoles are phytochemicals that stimulate highway Two and discourage highway 16. So that's your broccoli, your cabbage, your Brussels sprout, your cauliflower and your organics have a far higher content of the indoles. Flaxseed and chia seed both contain lignans. Lignans are another phytochemical that encourages Highway 2 and discourages Highway 16. Licorice. I'm not talking about Daryl Lee. I'm talking about the herb licorice. Have you ever had uh, Blackadder? It's a herb tea bag that's got peppermint, licorice, aniseed. Very nice. Might be as simple as having one or two drinks of that a day. But if you have high blood pressure, eliminate the licorice because if your blood pressure is high, it can boost it up again. And vitamin B. 6, vitamin B9, vitamin B12. These three vitamins have the ability to encourage Highway 16. Sorry, discourage Highway 16, encourage Highway 2 in the pathways in the liver. We have been giving you a mix. It's called Super B. And it has B1, B2, B3. That's for your energy cycle. B6, B9, B12 to encourage Highway 2 and discourage Highway 16. It's a great little mix. And number three, Australia sells a cream called the Anna's Wild Yam Cream. And the Anna's Wild Yam Cream contains the phytochemical diosgenin. And when diosgenin is absorbed through your skin to the fat cells, which is what you do with this cream, it stimulates the biochemical pathway that your body uses to make its own progesterone. The wild yam cream doesn't contain progesterone, but it has the starting blocks to stimulate your body to make its own. You'll find on the website some people will claim it's only the progesterone cream that you can use. It's illegal to, to prescribe progesterone cream in Australia. It's illegal to sell it. In America, you can buy it off the shelf. But when I go to America every year, I meet women who've been on this progesterone cream for a couple of years and it's not doing it. That's because if you put something into the body that the body makes, the body gets lazy. It says, I don't have to make this anymore. There's enough coming in. So the Anna's Wild Yam Cream is actually superior because it stimulates this pathway that your body uses to make its own. The Anna's Wild Yam Cream needs to be applied by a woman twice a day, every morning and every night. So the easiest thing is to put it next to the bed. Wake up, there it is, put it on. Before you go to bed, see it again, put it on. And women will apply approximately a third of a teaspoon. It's a good idea, the first time you do it, to get a teaspoon, level it off, take a third out, have a look, and then you've got some idea what to be doing every morning and every night. Where is it applied? To the tender parts of the body. Maybe the face this morning, the neck tonight, the chest tomorrow morning, inside of arms another time, abdominal another time, inside of thighs another time. You alternate the spots and a woman will apply it three weeks a month. If a woman is menstruating, she applies it for the three weeks that she is not menstruating. So you will see the three weeks she applies it is the, is the time that the progesterone is naturally high. 
If a woman has finished menstruation, she just chooses one week a month where she does not apply it. Some women find it much easier to eliminate the first or the last week of the month when they apply it. How long would a woman need to be on it? Maybe a year, maybe two, your body will tell you. One lady was on it for one year, her blood loss halved every month when she went on it. She was bleeding too much. She said after a year she stopped, she was menopausal age, and hot flushes started to come. So she went back on the cream. She tried another six months later and the flushes didn't appear. Can you see that? If you stop it, the symptoms return. What's the body saying? A little bit longer, please. One lady said to me, I've been on it six years. Is that a problem? I said, no. <laughs> There's no known toxic dose of progesterone. There's certainly a toxic dose of estrogen. I don't think I've met anyone that's too happy. Yeah, can you get that? <laughs> So basically you're the doctor there as to how much that you need. I was talking to one girl, she said every, every month her breasts almost double in size. She went on the Anna's Wild Yam Cream and in one month that was easing right down. I can't predict how long it will take. For some people it might take two months before they see symptoms subsiding. For some people, they see symptoms subsiding within a couple of weeks. Even though it may take a couple of years for the balance to get back, the symptoms can start to be relieved actually quite quickly. How old does one have to be? When I was in the Bronx in 04, I put a nine-year-old girl on it. Why a nine-year-old girl? She had breasts and she was menstruating at nine. That's a symptom of the hormonal imbalance. I met a woman in her 90s who was on it. Why was she on it? Well, she had osteoporosis and progesterone stimulates bone building cells. So if you're between nine and 90, you're eligible. <laughs> what about men? Because men are not cyclic, they apply the cream once a day and they don't have a break. So they would apply it maybe every morning like aftershave. You see, Progesterone is the precursor for oestrogen and testosterone. So whether you be man or woman, it's progesterone that needs to be stimulated, which will bring the balance. One man was scared to put the cream on his wife or touch her because he thought he might become feminine. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's progesterone that's stimulated, which balances the oestrogen and testosterone. You don't need to know if it's high or low. Just... Take the wild yam cream, it'll stimulate the progesterone and it'll bring the balance. What if you take the Anna's wild yam cream and there's not a problem? No problem at all. But I would say most people I meet have an imbalance. And it all came around the time that the pill was introduced, the plastics were introduced, the stimulants were given to the, to the animals. It's all coming in around that time. Number four is the eight laws of health. And we will begin to explore the eight laws of health tomorrow. Basically, in a nutshell, it's breathing fresh air. It's having a bit of sunshine every day. It's stopping anything coming into the body that will harm it. And I have found when women drink coffee and take sugar, it throws the balance out. One lady got all her balance back and then she rang me. She said, I've gone downhill again. I said, have you been doing anything? She said, I've started to drink a cup of coffee every day. And that was enough just to tip that balance. Going to bed early allows the body to rest and recharge. We'll look at that tomorrow. Exercise. Exercise brings balance back into the human body. Nourishing food. We'll spend all of Thursday looking at food. Hydration. Body doesn't work well in a dehydrated state. Peace. Laugh. We should laugh more. Do you know children laugh 125 times a day? So should we. <laughs> We're going to start to laugh more. Stress can really interrupt the balance. You see, those eight laws of health are the foundation. And I have found when women in, start to implement all this in their body, and keep that eight laws of health, it works.
In fact, if a woman is taking the wild yam cream and it's not having the effect that she wants, the detective had, has to go on. Is there something that's just holding her back a little bit? Is it that simple? Aren't you glad it is? It is that simple. And it's that simple because the human body has been designed to heal itself. And if it's been designed to heal itself, all we have to do is give it the conditions and it will happily bring the balance up and begin to heal you. Thank you for your attention. Tomorrow we're going to look at our first four laws of health and have a look at the incredible and powerful ramifications of breaking and keeping those laws. Mm -hmm.